Like, it's like, that's why we have people that are great accountants and not great basketball players is because we do have people that they recognize very early on. It's like, okay, I just don't have these physical capabilities. Doesn't mean I can't enjoy playing sports. I'm just not going to be in the NBA. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Well, Today's Wednesday. That means that tomorrow is Thursday, which means at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, the coffee and coaches conference call will be taking place as usual. Um, always a great group of people. Always great questions. Um, we get more and more every week, which is great. Um, so uh, please take the opportunity to join us. I realize it's early in the morning, but sometimes you have to brace the struggle. Okay. Uh, today's Q&A comes from Hamish. And so uh, Hamish had a question in regards to how gradients apply to movement. So we can do nothing without these gradients. And so we took this concept and we applied it to the each to the extremes of my two archetypes, the white ISA and the narrow ISA archetypes. And we re related it to how this will influence performance related outcomes. So I think this is gonna be a very useful call um, for a lot of people because I know that, that many still have questions about this gradient concept. Um, if you would like to participate in a 15-minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Put 15-minute consultation in the subject line so I do not delete it. We will arrange that at our mutual convenience. Don't forget that all of these videos eventually get posted up to the YouTube channel. So if you're if you're looking for something that has shown up in the past, like the impingement video is really popular, um, the push-up video is really popular. So go to YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel um, so you can get access to those as well. Everybody have a great Wednesday. I will see you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Coffee and Coaches Conference call. We are recording. The timer has started. Hamish, what is your question, young man? Okay, so I'm thinking about just the, the gradient within the model, um, how that's represented as we move. So uh, if we look, I'm thinking like a simple, simple representation as the uh, difference is the rise over the run, but then how's that um, sort of related to pressures or pressure management within the wide versus the narrow archetype um, and as they become, say, uh, more compressed. So okay. what do we, yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's speak very simply first and foremost about, about the gradient concept, okay? In all of the universe, nothing can happen unless there's a gradient. So, so that's step one. It's like, that's the thing yeah. that everybody's gonna gotta have to grasp because, because literally if there's, if there's no differential, if there's no increasing um, element and in, in gradient, we can't do anything, okay? At, at one end of that spectrum, we've got this low pressure eccentric bias representation in, in the narrow archetype. And we have the opposing strategy of, of this higher pressure wide ISA a bias, okay? And so thank you for saying rise over run because I don't think I've heard that in, since uh, freshman geometry. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I don't know if everybody knows what you mean it, it's it's the we're, we're looking at basically two hypotenuse uh when we're talking about the isas right and so so yeah. your wide your wide has a longer run than it does a rise and vice versa for the for the narrows and so it stands to reason that that because of those those helical angles are going to behave differently and so and you're absolutely correct and so when we're talking about activities the the greatest excursion and the greatest compression lies directly along that, that helical angle. And so we have to attend to those if that's the goal, if we want to stay on this maximal excursion. And so when we're talking about specific activities, if I was to, if I was just to say simply, a wide ISA is going to be a better bench presser and a narrow ISA is going to be a better overhead presser. And people will say, well, why is that? It's like, because th those two lifts approximate the, the orientation of the ISA much more effectively. So, um, the, the wider ISA individual has a lower potential for, a, for directly overhead reach. They have to create more compensatory activity, more strategy to get their arm into the same position overhead that somebody with a narrow word. So we always have to take that into consideration. I think in the, in the email you were talking about uh, a chopping activity or something. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and then that was, I was thinking with that as far as like, um, so how, how does the, the like the gradient then affects um, the positioning of the feet. So start like the, the width of the stagger and then also how it correlates with the um, say like a, 
a um, the chopping angle. Right. Uh, so in in relation to the degree of the um, say like oblique angle of the pelvis. Yep. Okay. You're so so you're absolutely on point here. We, we have to attend to that again. We first have to decide what, what our intention is, and under most circumstances, where we're sorry, it's my dog. That's all right. Under most circumstances, um, when we're trying to recapture movement, yeah. Again, the greatest excursion is directly along this heel angle. So, so somebody with a wider ISA is going to be on a much flatter angle for for any of those those types of activities. And then we have to respect the fact that th the depth of our stance is also going to be an influence. And so, when we talk about staggers, we have two feet here, and if I'm staggering my stance, it's like my narrow ISA I can I can put here because they have much greater potential for a much tighter turn. Whereas my my wider ISA again if if this is a, a parallel stance, I'm going to offset it this way, but I'm going to bias them more in, in a, a side to side stance, because again, that's where that helical angle is going to fall on, on its greatest excursion. Yeah. So it's less turn, right? So it's, it's not as yeah. steep an angle. And that doesn't mean that we can't get them to a steeper angle. Eventually, it just means that their bias, um, will prevent us from going to any form of extreme. If our goal is to recapture, ranges of motion, at least yeah. at, at the onset. It's like once we've established some measure of relative motion, we have greater potential for turns. But but by by the archetype, the one the the narrow bias is always going to have a greater greater potential for turn. They have a much yeah. tight, tighter helical orientation that's going to allow that to happen. And then say if you get like a narrow that's end game, is that that's like that's going to shrink for them as well, right? Because they haven't got as much space to okay. move into. This is so. This is a great. Or, uh, this is a great question, and you used the perfect word. You said shrink. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. So, so I have this representation of how much turning that I have available to me based on based on my my helical orientation. So again, we have a much much larger. Um, excursion of rotation in a narrow, whereas with a wide, I'm using my hands because this is really high tech call, right? So, yeah. so my narrow is kind of like this. So, so this would represent how much turn that we have. And for my narrow, so there, or for my wide rather, their excursion is going to be going to be much narrower. Okay. Yeah. Now, and that's that's literally just a structural bias. Now let's superimpose the compressive strategies on top of them. So, so the superficial strategies are anterior and posterior, and so they're going to bring the themselves closer and closer together. So what we get on a narrow is we're gonna get somebody that's gonna to start to get smushed, right, front to back. And so right away, I've stolen some of their ability to, to create that that turn, okay? And, and so again, um, as, I've, as I've said, it's like I need that ER space to produce IR inside of it well you're knit, you're taking away their external rotation space so so right away I've, I've limited the excursion in both internal and external rotation by superimposing the con compressive strategies when I get yep. to end game when I get to end game there is there is much less turning capability under all circumstances whether we're talking about a wide or a narrow okay because the the wide bias, started with a with a much lesser degree of turn you're going to see a much more significant deficit there but but you're going to see a significant deficit in both of them yeah and i think this like just as far as trying to restore relative motion i ran into a lot of problems or like a lot of walls as far as um you know not respecting the activity in certain um, certain tissues when doing um, certain activities um so like for instance, like trying to get like um, space in the pelvis, and then using like you know hamstrings to stabilize the pelvis, right. which, would, which would be you know overcoming um, action, but then and then sort of like that's causing interference with um, with restoring that motion. Correct. The, the thing that you have to be careful of, especially when you get towards the these end game representations where you have that posterior lower compression. If, if, and again, I always talk about getting that orientation first because you're not gonna be able to restore relative motions until you do. You have to have, again, you have to have that space for you to re recapture those. If I'm looking at, at end game strategies, you know you've got anterior orientations under those circumstances, right? So you've got to bring yeah. that back first, but you gotta be really, really careful how you bring that back. So especially, especially <laughs> with, with your narrow ISAs, you know, people say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tilt, I'm gonna posteriorly orient the, the pelvis with the, with the, with the musculature that's gonna, you know, typically do that. 
And yeah. under many circumstances, what you're going to get is you're going to get a compensatory posterior orientation, which means the whole pelvis posterior orients, you don't recapture the relative motions and you end up creating more spine um, movement, yeah. the, the relative movement within the pelvis. So you got to be really, really careful. And this is why I'm a big, big fan of the asymmetrical activities under those circumstances, because under that circumstance, I can create that space. So when we think about, especially end game narrows, so end game narrows start in a deficit because of the shape of the, of the, the uh, diaphragm, whether we're talking pelvis or whether we're talking thorax, we don't have any space in that, that posterior aspect of the pelvis. And so that's why you typically see this, this, um, post orientation versus relative motion recapture. The asymmetrical activities create this, this opposing strategy on either side of the pelvis. And then that's a much easier way to recapture that, that relative motion. Right. Yeah. And then that's going to, again, open up the, um, or increase the gradient on their excursion. And there you go. And now it's, so, yeah. so, and, and so, so there you go. So this is what you're doing. You're actually restoring the, the capacity for a gradient to exist because the greater and greater squeeze that I superimpose, I'm taking away gradient, right? So, so think yeah. of like the most extreme possible case, right? So you compress everything as hard as you possibly could. If there's no gradient, there's no movement. Yeah. Right. And, and then how that'd be like the, like your greatest output against resistance right? Like, yeah. think about, like the heaviest squat you've ever done and you lifted it and you just stopped dead, you know, right at the sticking point <laughs> and move. Yeah. No yeah. gradient. And, and until you release, until you release the pressure and then you go the wrong yeah. way, right? Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. And, and then um, if we're doing okay for time, is that so why we see like some people say they, someone that presents with the, the, the pylon um, skeleton, like skeleton, why they will only get so far when you're trying to restore movement? Um, and they have, may have a lot of interference because they've been pushed down harder than someone else, they, which they is are. in the opposite. Absolutely, and then, and this is just this is this is simple physics. You've got somebody with a yeah. with a velocity and and turbulent motion that's going downward, right? So oh, yeah. so I mean it, they. They they sort of lost the genetic lottery when it comes to <laughs> this inverted. Well, it, and it's just the unfortunate person. Yeah. But but again, it's like it's like that's why mm. we have people that are great accountants and not great basketball players is because we do have people that they recognize very early on. It's like okay, I just don't have these physical capabilities. Doesn't mean I can't enjoy playing sports. I'm just not going to be in the NBA, right? Yeah. Um, and so you know they get to do other stuff, which is what we need too. But but the reality is 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 that they they have. Um, genetically predisp predispositions to get stuck to the ground because the literally their internal downward velocity is greater. And so, yeah. so right away, you, you, you have so much more to overcome. And unfortunately, just developing force production is insufficient because in many of these cases, um, if you do increase force production, because there are some people that do this physical structure that can get very, very strong, they tend to not be very explosive. They tend to not be able to leave the ground because they need so much time to create the force that, you know, again, when we talk about the most explosive people, they can create extreme forces over very short spans of time. And then that's where they get to demonstrate velocities. That's where you get to see the guy with the 40. Well, I, I got to speak in inches here, brother, but 40. Yeah, that's right. 42 inch vertical jump. See, I'm an American. We don't, we can't think yeah. metric system, even though it makes more sense. Um, you know, but yeah. again, that, that's just, that's just the, the genetic reality, but that's why, that's why I think that, that when I, when I put together the, the representations of the archetypes and we started looking at the configurations, it becomes such a powerful and useful tool because you know, right away where you got to go. Yeah, no, definitely. That makes, um, yeah, it makes, makes a lot more sense. Um, I think that's kind of that, that's really all I had. Okay, you get you got all, like all you got you got like a minute. Come on, man. Okay, okay, cool. So how about <laughs> real quick? How about how how does that play out when you've got um, early and late stance uh, late stance representation, regardless of the archetype that have bunions? Okay, so is that so, too deep? Okay, so hang on. So what we we let's let's just say what a bunion actually is. So a bunion is yep. actually quest. Okay. So we have, we have the, the proximal segment. So we're going to talk about the first metatarsal. The first metatarsal is twisted 
twisted from ER to IR. So, so that's what that's what the, the first metatarsal is doing. And then the, the phalange is rotating in the opposing direction. You're going to see this repeated all the way up into every iteration under those circumstances. Yeah. This is somebody that's trying to apply a greater force into the ground. So they're trying to increase their ability to produce maximum propulsion into the ground. And so under the circumstances, think about this. If I have the double whammy, so let's just say that I have this really wide pelvis and I'm accelerating into the ground. Um, I got to push harder and harder. I got to push longer and longer, right? To, to, yep. to create the, the ability to, to resist getting crushed by gravity. So under those circumstances, you're typically going to see a foot that's going to be traditionally represented as being more pronated. You're going to, yep. you're going to see the people that are applying more and more force into the ground. So you're going to see it at the knee. So you'll see the, you'll see the internally rotated femur at the knee. You're going to see what has been traditionally called as a valgus, which is not a valgus. It's just another rotation. It's the same thing that's happening in the foot during the bunion. And you've got somebody that's pushing really, really hard into the ground all the time, which is why you see that representation. So that's what that is. Are you more likely to see it under these circumstances? Absolutely. I think so. And you'll see it yeah. in any number of representations, but it's always associated with somebody that's putting a lot of force into the ground for prolonged periods. Like I said, otherwise there's no reason to do it. Yeah, for sure. Because I, I remember on um, one of the earlier calls, you mentioned, um, like, say in that presentation, it's someone trying to push, they're pushing off that side. Absolutely. So it's, that's um, like, all oh, the, the, the kickstand you use, the... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I mean, in, in, um, I, I, I can't remember if we posted some extreme examples up on iFastU, but you'll see these wicked... Yeah. You'll see you'll see one foot that looks like the most extreme supinated foot on one side, and then the most extreme yep. of pronation with the, with the bunion on the on the other side as well. And again, th those those people are are they're fighting some serious rotational forces, but they're doing it for prolonged periods, which is why you see that adaptation. Yeah. So that's um. So I remember on the last I asked uh, you, Cole, when um, yep. you were talking about twisting the bones, um, and yeah, men like mentioned, I was with George, and you mentioned um, just like dampening forces. Yep. So that's kind of what they're trying to do. Yeah. So you're going to use you're going to use whatever you have available to you, and so, in, under under most circumstances, we're going to be utilizing connective tissues, right? Because that's where our, yep. that's how we move, my friend. We 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 move. Yep. Issues and so that's where you're going to see all these adaptations. Absolutely. All right, man. Cool. Great questions. Thank you nice. so much for, for for doing this. I appreciate you. I'll see you. I got an IFSU call tomorrow uh, afternoon based on when we're doing this one. So, okay. so I'll, I'll see you then. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's three in the morning, so it might be tough. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it'll be recorded. Thanks, all right, man. I'll yeah. see you. Uh, thanks, Bill. See ya. Bye.